because this is a this is a this issue is is it is a crisis, by the way. I mean, you know, and our and our concern, our first and foremost concern, has to be the fact of these hundreds of these hundreds of kids, thousands of kids, who in many cases are unaccompanied. They're minors, some of them exceedingly young, um, who, by the way, are in essence placed in the hands of coyotes and of of some really bad elements to get them here. Um, we have stories of some of them who have not made it here. Um, and what they, you know, and because it's, imagine you're subjected to human trafficking, to, to child prostitution and pornography. It's this horrible situation. So first and foremost is to be the, the kids. Um, and then how do we deal with it as a nation? The days of, and I'm going to say this in a general term, I mean there's exceptions, but the days of somebody in Honduras or Guatemala or El Salvador, you know, walking across, you know, walking up, and getting through Mexico and getting to the border and then looking around and, and crossing, those days are over. It's the same individuals, but now it is run by these drug and human trafficking cartels. This is a multi, these are multi-billion, um, uh, multinational crime corporations that in essence run this entire thing, whether it's human trafficking, whether it's trafficking of uh, migrants, whether it's drug trafficking, arms, you name it. And they've seen the fact that there is, you know, a, a perception uh, in Latin America, which they've helped also to, I think, uh, build on that if, you know, if you can get to the United States, you're in. Um, so, you know, you've got these groups. This is not just happening just because somebody's doing it. This is, this is organized. Organized by multinational, multi-billion dollar criminal enterprises uh, that have seen a weakness in the U.S. system uh, and are exploiting it. And, and then they're, you know, utilizing people who are in desperate need. And, and they're utilizing those people um, as a, this is a huge business. Unlike what you hear that the border is secure, it's not secure. It is not secure. I mean, anybody who says the border is secure has not been to the border. And I wanted to believe that it was secure. I went down there and you just talk to the Border Patrol folks and you see the holes in the fences and you see the pathways and, it's, and you see the lookouts, by the way, on the other side. Uh, again, it's organized crime. This is not... Um, those who are, you know, who are really doing this. This has always been a very difficult task. Um, if you would have asked me, whatever it was, three weeks ago, I would have told you that, as I said publicly, that we were on the cusp of getting it done. Now we are, uh, we've, we have a couple of new obstacles, including, you know, this whole thing with the kids and, um, and the perception that, that immigration reform is the reason that Eric Cantor lost his election, uh, which is erroneous. It's an erroneous perception. But that has created new obstacles. Um, but I've always said that it, it gets a lot more difficult if we don't get it done this year. This year is, time is running out. So we either get this done in the next few weeks or it doesn't happen. And I, so therefore, I think our chances are, I wouldn't say it's dead, but it's clearly even more difficult. Should we condition, should we condition the hundreds of billions of dollars, the, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars that normalization would mean on something? Or should we just normalize asking nothing in return? Let me tell you what I support. I support just three conditions. That's it. Which are the same th conditions that the then European community, now the European Union, had with Spain and Portugal. That's where my brother Lincoln got, in essence. Which is, look, in Cuba, when they free the political prisoners, the Havels, the Mandelas, of uh, the Sharanskis, right? Free those, free the political prisoners. I'll offer some basic freedoms, freedom of press, because without that, as much as we politicians like to complain about it, independent labor unions, uh, political parties, and then start the process for elections, and then sanctions should, must, and will go away. Until those three conditions are met, I do not support anything to loosen it, much less, by the way, at a time when they have now, um, they shipped the largest weapons uh, shipment to North Korea uh, since the sanctions, to, you know, since, since the, uh, the, the UN. Uh, so the largest one, at a time when they're holding an American hostage, at a time when repression has, been, has doubled, the number of arrests and the beatings have doubled over the year before. So, so here's the issue. What do I support? I support keeping the sanctions until those three conditions are met, not unilaterally, giving it, and particular when 
what you have is all these other conditions that I've already mentioned. But I, I do want to read something which, which, is, which I, because I, th- I, I get this question a lot. It's very good questions, but I want to just, I want to just read something to you guys. Um, you know, let me see. Yeah, you know, virtually of all the several dozen Cubans interviewed would like to visit Cuba either to see their relatives or just their country, uh, which they may not have seen for 10 years or more. And some segments of the exile community, especially young refugees brought up and educated here, are not interested in the Cuban issues. Uh, that was written by the New York Times in October 1974. March 1975, for the first time, a significant number of exiles are being to temper their, their emotions with hard-nosed ge- uh, geopolitical realism. New York Times, March 1975. I can quote you Miami Herald ones. 1985, Tom Fiedler. The memory was reinforced in a similar conversation with middle-aged Cuban-Americans who watched some of their, their you know, whatever, react in anger, frustration to the obvious Americanness of their young, you know. In other words, that story and those polls, by the way, which these stories reflected, have been going on. I thought it was since 1980s. No, since the 70s. If it's true that, that one, the United States not doing business with the regime has not made the regime collapse, which is true, it's also true that out of the, I don't know how many, 198 countries in the world, 200 countries in the world, there's what, five, three, Israel, the United States that don't have relations with, the United, with, uh, with uh, I think, uh, Lithuania that doesn't do business with the Castro regime. The rest do. There's no embargo. There's no sanctions. There's no tourism ban. And that hasn't knocked down the regime. So... What do we need to do to help knock down the regime? It's a, I think it's got to be a two-prong approach. Number one is deny hard currency to the regime. And number two is help the internal opposition, help the civil society in the internal opposition. That's what the U.S. policy has always been. It was strengthened under the Bush years, where we actually, for the first time, officially put money to help internal opposition um, and then try, try to continue and increase pressure on the regime. What has happened in the last few years, as I'm sure you're aware, is that there's been just the opposite. There has been a loosening of sanctions, which has have meant hundreds of millions of, of dollars to the regime, asking nothing in return. And what has happened? Repression is up. Um, beatings are up. Arrests are up. They're sending arms to North Korea. Um, so I think what you're seeing is when, and it's not only in Cuba, by the way, but when you loosen when you loosen the grip, when, when rogue thugs have more money, they don't tend to use that money to help their citizens. They tend to use the money to do bad things. It's been the, the case of the Castro regime when they had Soviet Empire money. Um, they had, you know, remember, they had arms and, uh, and troops in Africa. Uh, when they have less money, they're not as aggressive. But, but I believe that you should condition normalization on those three things. We're pushing, and the White House has, been, has not been very helpful, but we're pushing for targeted sanctions. I guess, I don't know how many students have to be killed in the streets. I don't know how many uh, arrests have to happen. I don't know how many different press sources have to be closed down. I don't know how many opposition leaders, mayors, have to be thrown in prison um, uh, for their political beliefs before you think it's timely. Um, I'm very consistent here. I think... Um, I think the United States needs to lead, and I think uh, I support the president when he talks about sanctions against you know what's happening uh, with uh, Putin's uh, thug you know regime. Um, I support that. I think we should do more and look at what, do, what ways of doing more. Uh, I, this inconsistency of how you treat, though, however, particularly in this hemisphere, um, foes of the United States and enemies of democracy who are repressing, killing, arresting, murdering. Um, uh, I don't know, I don't know how much, what else needs to happen before he reacts. I hope he will react. I will tell you, in the case of the Castro brothers, all we get are unilateral concessions. Um, and the more concessions that we get, what we get is the Castro regime seeing that as a green light. And then he further represses and then he gets more concessions. And uh, that's never worked in history.